foreclosure side of things, the mortgage and deed of trust side of things. That's the lien theory, title theory. Now we need to talk about the other half of a mortgage loan. Remember we said there's the collateral piece, but then there's also the what? What's the other piece? The actual loan, the, the promissory note. So now we want to talk about the note. What's in the note? And that's where the math comes in, because all of the math is based around the note. The note is going to determine what the interest rate is, how often the payments are made, all of those things. So a promissory note is the written promise to pay back the money in installments. Okay? And it's going to include things like the term of the loan, how long you've been loaned the money for, what the interest rate is, how much the monthly payments are. All those things are going to be determined in the promissory note. Things like, is it assumable? Um, is, it, uh, is there an acceleration clause? We'll talk about that in a minute. All those things will be part of this promissory note. Now, one of the most important things about promissory notes is that they can be sold. We call that negotiable. Now, it does not mean that they can be renegotiated at any time. It doesn't mean that the terms can be changed. But what it does mean is that the lender does not have to hold on to these promissory notes. They can sell that debt. They can sell it to other people who might be willing to purchase that debt. Because if you purchase the debt, now you have the right to collect the monthly payments. Does that make sense for everyone? And so there are lots of sources of investment money who are willing to purchase mortgage debt because they feel like it's a safe investment. They feel like it's a good way to get a good return on their investment but they don't want to make loans themselves because making loans yourself is a lot of work. I mean, you got to find the borrower, you got to qualify the borrower, you got to check their income, their credit history, all that sort of thing. You got to deal with them. So these people have money to invest, and I say people, they're really groups of people in most cases, have money to invest, and they're willing to invest it in mortgage loans. How many of you buy mortgages? Like, how many of you actively invest in mortgages? Raise right your hand. Like, uh, some of you should have your hands uh, up. Have a mortgage? How many of you have a 401k? Okay. Or a Roth IRA? Or some type of retirement plan? Or have money invested in a mutual fund? Or a stock index? Because if you have money in any of those places, folks, you're buying mortgages. Because one of the most common places those vehicles invest that money is in the purchase of mortgages. They call them mortgage-backed securities. And that's exactly why when the mortgage market sort of melted down in the late 2000s, it was such a widespread and huge implications across the whole economy because so many areas of the economy are so deeply invested in purchasing mortgages. You know, like for example, AIG, the world's largest insurance company. So you would think, how would they be affected by mortgages? Well, they weren't, except they had bought a little over $4 trillion worth of them. They were using all the premiums that were being paid in on their life insurance policies to purchase mortgages because the mortgages created earnings over time that paid them back. Does that make sense for everybody? And so what happens when all those mortgages start to fail? All of a sudden, the world's largest insurance company is on the brink of collapse because the mortgage market melted down. So that's all related to this idea that mortgages or mortgage notes can be sold. They're negotiable. And that's really what chapter 15 is all about. When we finally do get to chapter 15, chapter 15 is all about those notes being sold. So there are some special things that could show up in a note, some that are common and some that are not so common. This first one is very common. And on a test, you're going to see this as a test question. They're going to want to know what an acceleration clause is, what it does, what it accomplishes. It doesn't have to be in the note. But it most likely will be. Remember when we went through that the progression of foreclosure earlier? We talked about that, you know, the steps along the way. We said that the lender notifies the trustee that you're behind, and the trustee sends, <coughs> excuse 
excuse me, C9's louder. Um, the trustee sends what out when the lender notifies them that they're behind? What does the trustee send out to the borrower? Notice of default, right? And I said at that point in time, a very important, specific thing happens. What did we say happened with the loan balance at that point in time? The whole thing becomes due. I said we accelerated the due date. Well, that only happens if the note has an acceleration clause in it. An acceleration clause is a statement in a note that allows the note to be called due and payable in the event of what? A default. A default. In the event that the borrower defaults on that note for any reason, whatever, and it'll define what a default is. It'll have a bunch of different things that say this is a default, this is a default. And if you hit any one of those circumstances, the trustee has the right to immediately call that note due and payable. That's accelerating the due date. Does that make sense for everybody? Here's why it's there. If it wasn't there, here's what the foreclosure process would look like. Lynn is three months behind on her mortgage. She gets the notice of default from the trustee, which means they've begun the foreclosure process, right? So she goes and she gets a check for three months with a mortgage payment and she sends it in. And she can do that because her note does not have what? An acceleration clause. So what happens to the foreclosure? It goes away. She's caught back up and then she stops paying her mortgage again. And three months later she gets another notice of default. What does she do? She pays it and makes the foreclosure go away. It, if this acceleration clause was not there, it would allow essentially the lender to be yo-yoed back and forth by people paying, not paying. Does that make sense for everybody? So it's put in there as a protection mechanism where the lender basically has the right to say, no, you're in default, we, it's over, pay us all our money. That's what an acceleration clause is there for. This will be in almost any note you look at. We'll have one of these. Now, this one, will not be in almost any note you look at. These have become very, very, very uncommon. I don't know why we still test you on them, because it's very unlikely that you would come across a note that has a prepayment penalty clause. What does it sound like is happening here? A prepayment penalty clause. What's going on here? If you pay it off early, you gotta pay what? A penalty. Now think about it, there's a lot of circumstances where you might pay a loan off early, right? Would refinancing be paying it off early? Yes. Would selling the house be paying it off early? Yes. Yeah. Even making an extra payment would be paying it off early. See, this is a remnant from a time long gone where lenders made their money from interest. Where the lender made their money from interest. Because if you paid it off early, you had essentially robbed the lender of what? Money of interest. If you pay the note off, they're not getting any more interest. Lenders don't make their money with interest anymore. They don't own it long enough to make their money with interest. Because if you take that loan out today, by tomorrow, it's going to belong to somebody else. That bank simply doesn't care whether you pay off that note early, late, or not at all. Because what are they going to do with that note? They're going to sell it to somebody else. So the bank wants to do everything they can to incentivize you to do what? Not only pay, but refinance. They want you to refinance, because how do they make their fees? By writing what? New loans. Every time you write a new loan, do they get a new origination fee and a new, do they, when they sell it, do they make money off of selling it? Absolutely. So they want to do everything they can to incentivize you to get new loans. Well, a prepayment penalty would incentivize you to stay in your old loan. Does that make sense? So these have become very, very, very uncommon. They're not allowed in a lot of different kinds of loans. Like, for example, government-backed loans, FHA loans, VA loans, USDA loans, they're not allowed. But even in conventional loans, they've become very uncommon. Are they they're common in commercial loans? Um, they're more common in commercial notes because commercial notes are not sold nearly as often. Most commercial notes are what we call portfolio loans, and so they are more common on the commercial side. And then finally, the last one of these clauses that they like to ask you about in the test is called a due on sale clause or alienation clause. Alienation is just a fancy way of saying transfer of title or selling the property. Selling the property is alienation. So what do you think a due on sale or alienation clause would have to do with when you do what with the property? 
it. When you sell it. So when you sell it, it the note is what? Due. That's exactly right. When you sell the property, the note is due on the sale. So that doesn't sound all that weird. When you sell it, you have to pay the note off. That's what most people do, isn't it? Is it not? But think one step deeper. Think about something we talked about right before you went to the break. We talked about something called an assumption. What do we say was happening in an assumption? Somebody's buying the property, but they're also doing what? Assuming the other loan. Taking over the loan. So the property's being sold and the loan is not being paid off. It's being what? Continue. Continued or transferred over to somebody else. So, one way to think of a due on sale clause is it would be put in there to prevent what from happening. If a lender didn't want a loan to be assumable, then they would put a due on sale clause in there. But if a loan was assumable, you would not expect to find a due on sale clause in it. Does that make sense? Okay. So, if the lender wanted the loan to be assumable, you wouldn't see a due on sale clause. If the lender wanted to make the loan non-assumable, you would see a due on sale clause in there. That's what that would do. Everybody good on those three? Yeah. All right. When we start to talk about breaking down mortgage payments and calculating interest, it's important to remember how a payment is structured. We talked about a debt service payment back in chapter 13 when we did that before tax cash flow formula. Y'all remember debt service? What did we say debt service was? We said it was the mortgage payment. Do you remember what it included though? Principal and interest. The principal is the amount that you pay in on the loan balance itself. The interest is just the charge for using somebody else's money. That's a debt service payment. It's made up of two things, but you don't pay them all at the same time. And you don't pay them in the order that we say them. We ought to call it an IP payment rather than a PI payment. Because we pay the interest first. See, if you'll get that in your brain, then the math that we're going to do in a little bit will make so much more sense. Because there's going to come a point tonight where I'm going to ask you how much of this payment goes toward the principal. Well, the only way you can figure out how much goes toward the principal is to first take out the what? The interest. Because the interest gets paid first. If we tell you that somebody's monthly mortgage payment is $900, and we calculate that $800 of that is going toward interest, well, how much is going toward their principal? The $100 that's left over. That's all. That's all that's going toward the principal because we have to pay the interest first. Does everybody understand that? We good with that idea? Okay. Got to be paid first. So principal is the amount of the loan that we're paying off, and interest is the charge to use somebody else's money. And we refer to that payment together as the debt service payment, because you are in service to that debt. Now, when we talk about interest, interest can be either paid in advance or in arrears. I don't have this on the slide. I need to update these slides. Um, these are new slides, and so I've got to make some tweaks to them. I want you to add a couple notes here. I want you to add some information to this slide. I want you to put this on this slide. It says interest can be paid in arrears. Arrears equals the past. And that equals a word called accrued. I want you to write that down. Interest paid in arrears is interest paid for the past. So you're paying for something that already what? It already happened. It already built up. Well, that is also known as accrued interest. Interest that has already built up. See, I made my last mortgage payment on August 1. I have been accruing interest daily since I made that mortgage payment. What's today's date? 27. So how many days worth of interest have I accrued since I made my last mortgage payment? 27 days. Every day I owe more on that note than I owed the day before. Now the principal balance of the note's not changing, but what is changing? 
It's the amount of interest because that interest is being tabulated daily. So every day I owe more and more and more until I make a payment in September. And in September, what am I going to do with all that interest that has accrued? I'm going to pay it off. And then I'm, whatever little bit is left over is going to get applied to what? My principal. Is that making sense for you sort of logically before we start doing any math with it? Is everybody following me on that? The other thing I want you to write on here is interest that is paid for the future is called interim interest. I-N-T-E-R, and I can't spell I-M. Interim interest. That's interest paid for the future. Now, no matter whether we're talking about accrued interest or whether we're talking about interim interest, we're always talking about a portion of a month. Never more than a month. Because you're never allowed to accrue interest for more than a month. What do you do? You make another what? make another payment, you reset it. Does that make sense? So whenever you talk about accrued interest, it's always going to be from the beginning of the month until whatever day you're talking about. So right now, accrued interest would be from August 1 through August 27. And it's going to continue to accrue all the way up to August 30th, and then I'm going to do what on September 1? Make a payment, and that's going to reset the clock. Does that make sense for everybody? It's the way it works. When we talk about interim interest, that's future interest. And just like accrued interest, it's a portion of a month. But accrued was the portion of the month that's already what? Built up. It's already had, had, built up or passed. Whereas interim interest is going to be the portion of the month that has what? Not has happened. not happened yet. Here's where that becomes important. When we have a closing statement, which we're rapidly approaching in this class, getting to the idea of a closing statement, both the buyer and the seller have to pay interest on that closing statement. Which one of these do you think the seller is going to owe? Interest for the past or interest for the future? Interest for the past. This is a seller's interest charge. So what do you think the other one is? Interim is whose? That's the buyer's. So when we get to a closing statement, the seller would pay accrued interest. The buyer would pay interim interest. Well, they're both a portion of a month. So what do you think the buyer's portion of the month is going to be? From the day of closing until when? To the end of the month. Day of closing till the end of the month. It's always a portion of a month. So it's always going to be from day of closing till the end of the month. Does that make sense for everybody? Now I'm going to write something out for you here. So let's say we close, what's tomorrow's day? 28. Okay. So we got to close it. August 28th. So the seller's going to owe accrued interest from what day? August what? First through 28th. And the buyer owes interim interest from when? Oh, y'all think banks are much nicer than they are. 28. Through when? 30 days. When? August has 30 days, doesn't it? They all have 30. Welcome to the wonderful world of finance. January has 30. February has 30. March has 30. April has 30. The year has 360. I like it. 12 months of 30 days. That's what we use for all of our calculations in this class. They're all equalized. And if you think about it in finance, that makes sense. Think about rent. You don't pay more rent in January than you do February, even though it's three days longer, right? We equalize it. 
And so we use a 30-day month and a 360-day year for all of the math calculations here. Now here's what I want you to pay attention to about those dates. Does one of those numbers appear twice there? Yes. So what does that tell you about that day of closing? Who's paying for it interest-wise? Both. Both of them are. The seller is going to pay accrued interest for the day of closing, and the buyer is going to pay interim interest starting on the day of closing. Does that make sense for everybody? Now, here's going to be, believe it or not, the hardest thing about calculating accrued versus interim interest. How many days is this from August 1 through the 28th? 28. 28. That's pretty easy, right? Everybody can handle that. 28 days. How many days is this? It's three days. That is not two days. That's three days. Because it's August 28th, 29th, 30th. It's three days. So here's my mental trick. Yes, because this is 28, this is three. Yes, every month has 30 days. But when you're calculating how many days there are for interest purposes, what are you going to do your math from? Not 30, but what? 31. Because that's the only way you're going to account for unless you use fingers and toes. Now, you can use fingers and toes. You can go 28, 29, 30, like that. But if you're going to do the math way, which I know most of you won't do, then it's easier to subtract from 31. 31 minus 28 equals how many days? Three days. Okay? One way or the other, you've got to get in your brain straight that that day of closing counts for both of them, for interest purposes, only for interest purposes. When we start doing prorations later on in the game, it's not worked that way. When we're splitting an expense between the two parties, but interest is not split between the two parties. They, there are separate loans. The buyer's got a loan, the seller's got a loan, and that's why they overlap on that day of closing. So how do you go get double interest? It's two different banks, usually. Is that what it is? Usually, but even if it's the same, it's two different loans. Because you're trying to make it split between the two. They're not splitting up the loan. The seller's got a loan. The buyer's got a loan. When's the seller paying off their loan? On August 28th, right? So the bank wants interest for that day. When's the buyer taking out their loan? on August 28th, so their, that, their bank wants interest for that day. Everybody with me on that? Okay. So interest in arrears or accrued is in the past. Interim interest is in the what? Is in the future. Good. Good. Try to get all that cleared out before we get to the math part because you don't want to make a you don't want to make a stupid mistake and get your interim interest calculation wrong because you use two days instead of what three, and that will be an answer choice because it's a very common mistake. It's a very common mistake. Question: So, if you get a question that says something about February, there's no way thirty one days in February. Thirty, like every other month. Well, you know, interest purposes. Thirty. 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 But we'll 30. <laughs> <laughs> so you literally would write down, interim, so if this was closing on February 15th, the interim interest would be from February 15th to February 30th. You would treat it like any other month. They're all the same. But when we're calculating then we need to use 31 unless we want to use if you're doing the math version to calculate interim interest, if you're doing the subtraction method, because that's what most people want to do. Since it's in the future, most people just want to say 30 minus 28, right? So if you want to say 30 minus 28 is 2, plus I got the extra day, that's 3, if you want to do it that way. If you want to say 31 minus 28 is 3, that works too. If you want to just go 28, 29, 30, well, that works real well when it's 3 days, but what if we're closing on February 2nd? You can really, I mean, you might be there a while, right? So, but whatever the method is, I don't care. Come up with a consistent method to make sure you're counting that day of closing. Okay, we all good with that? Okay. So, most interest is paid in arrears. 
Most commonly, interest is paid in arrears. We generally only charge interim interest at the closing. That's a buyer thing. And then they fall into the regular, normal pattern of paying their interest in reverse as accrued interest. And so it, it gives an example here. It says, for example, a mortgage payment made on February 1 covers the interest that built up or accrued during the month of January. So you're paying interest in the past all the time. Okay. That's an important note on this last bullet point here. It's, it's a simple one, but it's an important one. It says interest is charged only on the outstanding loan balance. In other words, you only pay interest charges on what you actually owe. So every month, hopefully, you're paying your loan balance down by a little bit. If you're paying your loan balance down by a little bit, what should also be coming down month after month? The amount of interest you pay. So talk to me about this. If your payment stays the same, and they do in most cases, month after month, but a little bit less of that payment each month is being taken up by interest, what does that also mean about the principal? A little bit more of the principal is being paid month after month. And when I say a little bit now, I mean a little bit. We're talking 20 cents a month type thing here. We're not talking big swings. But in a, in a normal amortization schedule, there's a fancy word amortization. That just means spreading it out over multiple payments. In a normal amortization schedule, you would see that trend where every month a little bit smaller amount of the payment was going toward interest and a little bit larger was going toward what? Principal. Toward principal. Because at the very beginning, the vast majority of that payment's going toward interest. interest. It's shocking how small the amount is going toward principal early in this, especially a 30-year mortgage. So that's why they don't care if you foreclose later because they've got most of their money up front anyway. Correct. They collect it's particularly most of the interest up front. The interest is front loaded. Absolutely. Late in the loan, they're collecting very little in the way of interest. So horrible, isn't it? <laughs> Bankers. You know, what are you going to do with them? We're going to get out of the hurry. <laughs> 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 Uh, so let's talk about the math of calculating interest. When we talk about calculating interest, here's your T-bar formula. And it is actually important to learn it as a T-bar because it has come to my attention that on the national portion of the exam now, they've started sneaking in questions that were not there previously. Previously, they only wanted to know how much the interest charge was. Now, it is my understanding that they might ask you what the loan balance is. They might give you the interest and the interest rate and say, well, how much money do they have? Well, could you calculate that with a T-bar? So when you learn it as a T-bar, you can come up with any of the three things because you know the T-bar. Does that make sense for everybody? Mm -hmm. So as far as calculating the interest, the interest is just going to be the principal amount of the loan, the amount we owe, times the annual interest rate. And that will give us the annual interest in dollars. Now, if you wanted monthly interest, what would you need to do with that number? Divide it by 12. Divide it by 12. You, want it, you want annual broken down to monthly, you divide by 12. If you want it daily, you would take annual and divide by what? 360. Because there's 360 days in the year. So this formula you're going to use repeatedly in calculating interest. If you wanted to know the interest rate, what two numbers would you need to know? Annual interest and the principal amount of the loan. Does that make sense for everybody? Okay. All right. So let's look at an example here. Just a very simple example. It says a $125,000 loan is issued at 8.75% annual interest. How much is the annual interest charge? Well, they're asking us for the annual interest up here at the top. So what two numbers do we need to know? We need to know the loan amount and what else? and the annual interest rate. And they gave us both of those. So we got a $125,000 loan. We've got an 8.75% annual interest rate. Those two things are side by side, so we multiply them, right? So 125 times 8.75%, that is $10,937.50 per year of interest at that loan balance. Everybody okay with that number? Feel pretty good about that. Because that's going to be the basic building block for a lot of this. Are we all good? 
directly to monthly, we've got to first get to what? Annual. annual. So to get to annual, we need the principal amount of the loan, which is $218,000, times 6.25% annual interest. And that gives us $13,625 annually for interest. Does that make sense for everybody? Okay. So... We take that number, divide it by 12, and that'll break it down to monthly. That's $1,135.42 in monthly interest. So that means the first $1,135 of their monthly mortgage payment is going toward what? Interest. Smoking, ain't it? Those numbers get big in a hurry on a 30-year note. They get very large. Eleven hundred. What is that? Almost forty dollars a day in interest. Okay. Just think how much you paid in interest while you were sitting here. All right. Everybody good on this? Okay. So go ahead and do this. Then. Calculate the monthly interest charge on the following loan. Go ahead and run through those and give me a monthly interest charge. Shouldn't take you too very long. I feel about those numbers. Everybody pretty much in agreement on those? Yeah. Okay. So not too not too complex yet, right? Not yet. <laughs> no, I wouldn't make it hard on you. Never do. Exactly. Alright, look at this one. It says, Sam makes his monthly loan payment April 1, which includes interest of $1,071.88 that accrued during March. 
His loan is written at 5.25% annual interest. Based on this, what is his loan balance? So look at the T-bar. They want to know which one of these three pieces. Top, bottom left, or bottom right? Which they want to know? They want to know bottom left, the principal amount of the loan. So what does the T-bar say we need? We need the annual interest, and we need to do what? Divide it by the what? The annual interest rate, okay? So the annual interest we didn't get, but what did we get? We got monthly interest. Does everybody see that? They gave us monthly interest, so what can we do with that number? Multiply it by 12, and that's the first thing we do right here is multiply that monthly interest times 12 to get annual interest of $12,862.56. we all okay on that? And then the T-bar says once we've got annual interest, we can divide it by the annual interest rate to figure out the loan amount. So if we divide that $12,862.56 divided by 5.25 I come up with two hundred and forty five thousand oh one and some change, about fourteen cents or so. Sound about right? For a loan balance there? Good. Good. Just a matter of following that T-bar. Okay? So go ahead and do these three then. Go ahead and try to go to these three loan balances. about those. That's all right. Check them as you get Because in each one, what I've done is taken the monthly interest and multiplied it by what? 12 to get the annual. And then annual interest divided by the interest rate should give us the loan balance. All good? Breaks my habit. I've got a bad habit of not looking at monthly and acting like it's year, you know, acting like it's yearly when it's right. monthly. I 
Right, you, I, I, so you I, I, so I, I, got a better word for you, I right? Start circling. circling every time I you see circling. circling things. You see it? 150,000 on the last one. Okay, we all good? Move on to the next mm -hmm. screen. Okay. So the next one is just the third example of what you could be asked to calculate. Here, obviously, a T-bar always has three components, so you could be asked three different things. It says Omar pays his mortgage on the first of each month. His July payment included accrued interest of $1,050 owed on the outstanding $315,000 loan balance. Based on this, what is the interest rate of the loan? So if they want to know the interest rate, we're calculating this right here, bottom right. Is everybody with me on that? So what does the T-bar say we're going to be doing? Annual interest divided by what? Principal amount of the loan. Well, they gave us the principal amount of the loan. That's easy. They gave us 315. But again, they gave us what kind of interest. They didn't use the word, but they used the word accrued. And accrued is always what? Monthly. Monthly. When you pay accrued interest, you're paying interest that accrued over the previous month. Does that make sense? So what do we need to do with that 1050? Multiply it by 12. Multiply it by 12. So that's our first step. Annual interest is going to be 1050 for the month. Multiply it by 12. It's $12,600 for the year. And then that $12,600 for the year gets divided by $315,000. And that's 0.04. Remember, anytime we're calculating a rate, what do we have to do with our final answer? Multiply it by 100. So that is a 4% interest rate on that note. Okay. So next screen, just go ahead and run through these and make sure you can calculate an interest rate. Characters? Somebody go. <laughs> I felt like I had a VA. Oh, you had a what? A VA. Oh. Okay. Okay. 
<laughs> Sounded like she had some milk, but I should <laughs> 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 I want to make sure. <laughs> 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 Easy. You know, sometimes you set it up on the tee and I can't help it. It's a curse. All right, so first one I come up with 4.25%, the second one 5.5%, and then 3.75%. See, it's just a matter of plugging those numbers into the T-bar, right, no matter which way they ask it. So if you want to learn that T-bar, then you can easily come up with any of those answers. Everybody okay so far? Good. So, let's start to add some little wrinkles into things here. It's all going to be based around that same idea, though. It's all based around calculating the interest, because if you can calculate the interest, you can always calculate the amount going toward the principal. Does that make sense? Because we know what the payment's going to be, and then it's just a matter of taking the interest out, and what's left over is the amount that's going toward the principal. Is everybody all right with that? Okay. So this idea of amortization, that's a really fancy word. It doesn't have to be the amortization just means spreading things out over time. Most mortgage loans are amortized. And in fact, most mortgage loans are amortized over how long of a period of time? What's the term of most mortgage loans? 30 years. So amortization just means spreading those payments out over the course of 30 years and having the payments all be the same. That's what amortized means. Now, remember, just as a reminder, every time we make that payment, we pay what first? Interest. Interest. Good. Now, when we talk about amortization, we could have fully amortized loans, or we could have what we call partially amortized loans. Fully amortized versus partially amortized. Fully amortized means the balance is fully paid down. That means you've, pay, you've spread the payments out enough that if you were to make every single payment as scheduled, at the end you would owe how much money? Zero. Zero. As soon as you make that last regularly scheduled payment, you have fully paid this debt off. Does that make sense? So fully amortized means the debt is fully paid off. What do you think partially amortized means? The debt is partially paid off. A partially amortized loan is one where your payments aren't big enough. Your monthly payments aren't big enough or your term is not long enough. One is true. Either you're not paying enough per month or you're not paying it for a long enough time to pay this thing all the way down to zero. See, the lender, there's no rule that says the lender has to give you 30 years to pay it off. And as a matter of fact, in commercial real estate, they never do. You know what the most common term is in commercial real estate? Loans? Seven years. A seven-year term. Now, I heard some of you pucker up. <laughs> Here's the thing, though. They don't make payments based on a seven-year payment cycle. Because if they did, they could never afford to pay. But can you imagine buying Crabtree Valley Loan having to finance it with a seven-year amortization schedule? What would the payment look like, for God's sake? It'd be astronomical, right? So, we'll give you a 30-year amortization schedule, which means your payments are set up so it would take you how long to pay it off? 30 years. 30 years. But we want our money in seven years. If you're making payments, that it would take you 30 years to pay it down to zero, but you've got to pay it all back in seven years. Oh. What are you going to have at the end of this thing? You're going to have a balloon payment. You're going to have a big amount that's still not paid off at the end of that seven years because your payments weren't big enough to pay it off in the course of the seven years. Does that make sense to everybody? What's the motivation? Why does the borrower do a partially amortized loan? What's the benefit? You get smaller interest rates, right? No, not a smaller interest rate, but you smaller something. Payment. 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 The payment is manageable. Yeah, the payment is smaller on a partially amortized note than it is on a fully amortized note. Does that make sense for everybody? Mm -hmm. It's a smaller payment. That's the only motivation for it, is the smaller payment. If people could afford the fully amortized payment, that's what they would do. Now, most 
mortgage loans on residential property or what, which one do you think they are? Fully. Fully amortized, whereas most commercial notes are going to be partially amortized. So yes, ma'am. Is that partially amortized or those, those, um, those payments? Well, adjustable rate has nothing to do with it yet. Because you could have fully amortized adjustable rate, you could have partially amortized adjustable rate, you can have fully amortized fixed rate, partially amortized fixed rate. The amortization, the, the, yes, we're going to get to that, but that doesn't relate to the amortization cycle. The amortization cycle just relates to can I pay it off in full with these payments over this amount of time? Yes, sir. Is it a valid question for me to ask you about the interest? Do they just pay most of the interest, not much principal, or is that not really factored? Well, that's very true. Because if your amortization cycle is scheduled, matter of fact, look at this next graph. This is a graph that shows you the breakdown of a 30-year amortization cycle payment, with the big chunk being the what? Yes. The interest and the small chunk, at least in the beginning, being the what? Yes. Principal. So if you have a 30-year amortization cycle, but you only have a seven-year term, when you get right here, what do you pay? Mostly what? Yes. Interest. You paid mostly interest. You paid very little on the principal. So it's kind of like the same schedule. You just go seven years into it. You just go seven years into it. Now they want their money. Okay. Now you probably don't have all that money in a lump sum. So what are you going to have to do? Most likely, you're going to have to get another loan and refinance that thing. That's why they do this in commercial real estate because the value of commercial real estate can change so dramatically in a short amount of time. The bank basically wants another opportunity to look back at this thing to make sure it's worth lending on. In seven years. So you, so your lender would take back their funding if you have to underwrite. Right, a new, loan. new loan, new loan. That's exactly right. You've got to get a new loan to pay off the old loan, and now you start over again with another seven-year, probably still a thirty-year cycle, but a brand new loan. Yes, ma'am. So, whatever equity that you've earned in it, because you paid it down. Oh, you start, you refinancing that what you owe at this point. That's right. You're refinancing simply what you owe. So you have built equity. Okay. You just haven't paid off the full amount. Okay. And the purpose of that, you say, is because the lender don't want to take that risk. The lender doesn't want to take that risk. That's exactly right. They don't want to lend you money for 30 years on a commercial property because what could a shopping center look like 30 years from now? Like It could be Triangle Town Center, right? I guarantee you somebody's sweating a note. By the way, y'all remember we were talking about Sears at Crabtree Valley the next day. There it was, a store closure list, and that was when I was on the list. You know what they need to do that, Bob? I'm sorry? I think maybe they should do the mall, turn it into just all restaurants inside. Triangle Town Center? Yeah, you can go to one place and all the restaurants are there. Maybe no. we will. I have to do something. No, you have no, It's going to be a big empty hole. We still got to be about the okay. Everybody good on this idea here? On an amortization cycle? Now, we could actually even have, we talked about a balloon payment, so anything less than a fully amortized loan is going to have a balloon payment at the end. Now, with a partially amortized loan, we paid the debt down what? Partially. Partially. So the balloon payment is going to be less than what we originally borrowed, but more than zero. Somewhere between those two. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. We paid the debt down some, but not all the way to zero. That's a partially amortized loan. Could we have could we have a loan that's not amortized at all? Yes. We call them interest only loans. Mm -hmm. An interest only loan is a loan that is not amortized at all. And what that means is that you owe what at the end of the loan? All the principal. The same thing you borrowed on day one. You never touch the principal balance of the loan. That's true. So this is this is where to understand these topics, the question you should ask yourself in finance is why? Why would somebody get that kind of loan? What's the benefit of that kind of loan? What do you think the obvious benefit is going to be of an interest-only loan? A loan where you're only paying the interest, but you're not paying anything toward the principal. There's only one benefit to it. Low payment. That's it. That's the only reason. So if your decision, your financing decision, is completely payment-driven, then you might do an interest-only loan. So you just rent and you don't want to own that. No, that's not true. That's not true. And here's why that's not true. Because you're thinking about it as a house. 
Stop doing that. Mom said even commercial property, you wouldn't know. Even commercial property. Who cares if you pay it off? And that's where you you got to wrap your brain around this bigger idea. Okay. That commercial property, is it going to generate income on an annual basis? Yes. Yes. So if I've got a commercial property that's generating $100,000 in before tax cash flow, uh -huh. is there some benefit to owning it even if I'm not paying the loan balance down? Yes. yes, because I'm turning a hundred thousand dollar profit okay. as a result of owning that property. Okay. Who cares if I'm paying the loan balance down? Because who's making those interest payments anyway? The, payment the, tenants, the, the are. tenants are. Okay. And I'm making the difference. I'm making the hundred thousand dollars. So there's a huge benefit to owning it, even if I'm not paying the principal balance or down. Or the opportunity cost be greater by taking that money and putting it elsewhere. They make, make, maybe make I more make money. more money by putting like it elsewhere, somewhere else. Yeah. Leverage it. Or maybe the increase in value. And I could still be building equity because the property could go what? It could go up in value even though I'm not paying my loan balance down. Does that make sense? Yeah. And because here's the thing. If I had a, even a partially amortized mortgage, would my before tax cash flow be still be $100,000? Yeah. yeah. Well, uh -uh. No. Because what would be greater every month? My debt service would be greater every month. My mortgage payment would be higher on a partially amortized loan. It would be much higher on a fully amortized loan. So I'm making the decision. I'd rather have the $100,000 a year than make $70,000 a year but be paying my loan balance down. Okay. That's the decision I'm making as the owner of that. Does that make sense to you guys? Do you see why you might be motivated to do that now? So it's depending on what your end result is. It's exactly right. What do you want as an investor? What do you want as an owner? Do you want to maximize the money now or do you want to pay the balance down on this property? So do you want to get to the point at some point where you pay the balance off or do you want to just milk this thing for every penny you can get out of it? Because if you want to milk it for every penny you can get out of it, what kind of loan are you going to get? Interest. Interest only. And then sell it in seven years somebody else may Maybe it. sell it or just refinance it. Mm -hmm. Maybe you let the party keep rolling. <laughs> Are, are but does that make sense? Yes. All right. So that, that's a balloon payment, and that's the difference. So let me rank rank them for me. Highest payment to lowest payment. Fully amortized, partially amortized, interest only. What, what's the highest payment? Fully amortized is going to be the highest payment because that's the only one that pays the debt all the way down to what? Zero. Zero. What's going to be the lowest payment? Interest only because you're not touching the principal. Does that make sense? And so the one in the middle is the partially amortized. Anything less than fully amortized is going to result in a balloon payment. Let me introduce another ugly idea to you. What about something called negative amortization? Negative. Amortization. Well, amortization means paying the loan balance down over time. So what do you think negative amortization means? You said owe something. You're only you paying part of the interest. You're not even paying all the interest. You're making a payment, but the payment's not big enough to cover the what? Interest. The interest that is accruing on a monthly basis on that loan. What's the point? See, you got to ask the why. The why is the important question. Why would somebody do that loan? Payment. That's the only motivating factor is payment. Now, that's insane to me. Let me show you something. How many of you have ever uh, heard of Wachovia? I mean, Wells Fargo, right? Walk all over well, way back in the day when Wachovia existed, <laughs> walk all over. Yeah. when they existed, Wachovia bought a bank in 2008 named World Savings out of California. And World Savings, fantastically successful bank in California. And they had a tremendous loan portfolio. And they were making these fancy loans. And when you got the, pay, the statement every month in the mail, this is what it said at the top of the statement. That's what it said on your mortgage statement. Pick a payment. Each month 
you had a different option? I mean, you had the same options? Now, of course, all consumers in the United States know what the words term and fully amortized mean, don't they? Yeah. They don't, but they do know what one word means. Minimum. <laughs> they know what that means. What box got checked on these statements? Minimum due. What do you think term is another word for? Is that a balloon? Interest only. So, by choosing to only pay $1,987 a month, they were choosing to not even pay the interest that was accumulating or accruing on that mortgage. Now, do you think most consumers realize that? No. No. And so, they were choosing this minimum payment. They think, I'm making my house payment, man. I'm paying this thing off. What was actually happening was that this $400 gap here was being what? added to the note. So their loan balance went up by $400. And now next month, not only were they, did they have that gap, but now they're paying interest on that additional money. Because they're paying interest on a higher loan amount. Does that make sense for everybody? That is called negative amortization. Now, World Savings had a tremendous portfolio of these loans. They had millions of these loans. This loan is why Wachovia does not exist anymore. Wachovia paid $25 billion for world savings. Within a year, this loan portfolio had lost $125 billion. Because clearly, these people cannot afford this house. It's like a Ponzi scheme. That's exactly what it is. It's exactly what it is. Now, the way this was sold to the consumer was it doesn't matter that you're not paying your mortgage balance down because your house is going up in value so fast that all you need to do is what? Make the minimum payment. Oh, and by the way, did I mention this was an adjustable rate mortgage? Oh, no. So then two years later, what happened to the interest rate on this thing? And what, when the interest rate goes up, what happens to all these numbers? They go up dramatically. Now they can't even afford the minimum payment. So here comes your friendly, your handy dandy banker along to save the day. Oh, don't worry about that, hon. We can refinance you. Because your property's gone up so much in value, we can refinance you. And I tell you what, if you're having a problem making your mortgage payment, we'll even let you pull some cash out. These people were pulling cash wow. out so they had enough money to make the damn mortgage payment. Wow. And we wonder why we had a mortgage meltdown. Because these exotic types of mortgages have a place, but it's not in the residential market. Does that make sense for, for you guys? Truth and so then, yes, it did. Yeah. People don't read what they sign. Oh, okay. People don't read what they sign. So then what, what happened eventually? They end up having a foreclose? Foreclose. Okay. Because eventually what happened is the property value stopped going up. Mm -hmm. And when the property value stopped going up, they could no longer refinance. Mm -hmm. But the, the interest rates continued to adjust and the payments mm -hmm. continued to go up to unmanageable levels. Mm -hmm. And so they were eventually foreclosed on. And when they start to get foreclosed on, what does that do to the other property values around them? It drops them down, which puts even more people into foreclosure danger. And it just it's just an unwinding spring at that point. It just just, mm -hmm. you know, just spirals out of control. So so the hundred and twenty five, I guess, billion that they lost, that would have been in the foreclosures? That was in foreclosures. Notes that failed. All the notes that failed. All the notes that failed. So ultimately that purchase ended up costing Wachovia hundred and fifty billion dollars and it crippled them so badly that they went under. And that's when they were sold to Wells Fargo.
So, I mean, I know the common sense, but why, why wouldn't why Cody look at all what they That's a wonderful the question. Why yeah, didn't they, they look at this? Yeah, look at why didn't they look at what they were buying? What they were buying. Uh, they never did, apparently. They probably looked at the tree. The, well, they, they looked at what they looked at because this was a very profitable loan. Because it's a bank and you can trust them. This was a, this was a very profitable loan. How was that bank able to stand? How were they able to stand? Yeah. Because they were selling that risk. Remember, they weren't keeping that risk. They weren't keeping those notes. They were selling it off to other other organizations. They were based in California. They made loans on the whole West Coast. Yeah. And Wachovia would be the biggest thing. They probably kept the loan versus selling them for They Wachovia. did. They did. Wachovia and Barman put the risk on their books. Versus selling them off themselves. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. That's what he meant. But so now, do you, does it help to understand these terminologies, yeah. right? So fully amortized. This is the payment they should have been making if they were planning to do what? Yeah. Pay it down to zero. If they wanted to just cover the interest, they should have been paying this number. And of course, with this number, they're getting further and further in the hole. Okay? Like my Lane Bryant account. Oh, God. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my people from the other class are going to be like, what is going on in that class at night? I swear I go home sometimes, but I'm like, you would not believe the things you guys said in that room. <laughs> <laughs> I told somebody last week, I said, I made a Pee Wee Herman joke. I said, oh, you did not. I said, yes, I did. And they're like, and they're like did their jaws in the form? I'm like, they were loving it. You got to know, know this group. You just got to know this group, right? You got to do something to keep yourself away from 9 o'clock at night. Okay? So the next thing we want to talk about is something called a loan-to-value ratio. A loan-to-value ratio has to do with the amount that a lender is willing to lend on a property. Very rarely is a lender going to be comfortable with lending 100% of the value of the property. I mean, think about, so let's like get away from mortgages for a second. Think about something like a pawn shop, okay? If you go into a pawn shop, will they make you a loan based on some collateral you have? They will. So, I mean, if you go in with collateral, you walk in the pawn shop, you got collateral, they look at the collateral, they come up with a value for it, right? They, they look at it, they try to determine a value for the collateral. Are they going to lend you 100% of the value of the collateral? No. no, because their fear is that they won't be able to get all their money back if they do that. Does that make sense for everybody? They're not just looking at the fact that you have to repay them. They're worried about what happens if you don't repay them. They want to make sure that they've loaned out a small enough amount of money that if they had to sell that piece of collateral, they could get all their money back. Does that make sense for everybody? Mm -hmm. L mortgage lending works the exact same way. We just call it a loan-to-value ratio. The loan-to-value ratio is simply the maximum percentage of the property's value that the lender is willing to lend. I'm going to go ahead and tell you that magic number is generally 80%. That has traditionally been the magic number. 80%. Now we're going to talk about a lot of loans that are above 80% loan to value, but they all have one thing in common. They, they, they are insured. They get mortgage insurance to cover the risk because they are inherently risky. Lenders look at a loan and say, I'm comfortable lending Michelle 80% of the value of this property because if Michelle doesn't pay and we have to go through foreclosure, we feel like we could sell it and get what? and get our money back as long as we haven't loaned more than 80%. Does that make sense for everybody? So when we talk about a loan to value ratio, it's really just a way to calculate the maximum a lender will lend. So for example, it says that the loan amount is equal to the market value times the loan to value rate. Now this I want to point out. Look at this note over here. It says market value is either sales price or appraised value, whichever is what? Less. Less. How many of you have ever heard real estate brokers or people who are buying a house talking about, oh, the house didn't appraise? Mm -hmm. And they get all in an uproar about the fact that the house didn't appraise. Mm -hmm. Here's why. That loan amount is going to be based on the lower of two numbers, either the sales price or the what? 
the appraised amount. So if the house doesn't appraise for the sales price, all of a sudden what just went down? The amount the bank is willing to do what? The amount they're willing to lend because they're only going to lend based on the lower of those two numbers. Does that make sense for everybody? Okay. That's the way an appraisal works with a loan to value ratio. So look at this example here. It says a home is being purchased for $425,000. The buyer is obtaining an 80% LTV mortgage loan at 5% interest, and they want to know what is the loan amount. So the home is being purchased for $425,000, and the buyer is getting an 80% loan to value mortgage at 5% interest. What's the loan amount? Well, do we need the 5% interest for anything? No, it's just fluff. It's, it's information that we don't need. The two things we need to know are the market value of the property and the loan-to-value ratio. Well, they only gave us the purchase price, so we have to use that as the market value. So that's $425,000. And the loan-to-value ratio is 80%. So the maximum loan amount is $340,000. Couldn't you also calculate somebody's down payment by looking at that? The down payment is going to be the difference between those two numbers, right? And not that you need to know that for this chapter, but just pointing it out. How much would the down payment be on this property? Well, you, well, you can say 20% of the 425, or you can just look at the difference between those two, right? It's $85,000. you got to make up the difference. $85,000 for a down payment. All right, so here's an example. A home is being purchased for $178,500. The buyer is obtaining a 90% loan-to-value mortgage loan at 4.5% interest. What's the monthly interest? Well, we did plenty of questions earlier where they asked us for the monthly interest. But what did they always give us? Well, they, they gave us the interest rate. Well, we got that. What else did they always give us? Back then, they were giving you the loan amount, weren't they? Yeah. Here, they did not give you the loan amount. They gave you the purchase price, and they gave you the loan to value ratio. So what do you think you're going to have to do here? Before you can calculate the interest, you've got to calculate how much what? How much the loan is for. You've got to calculate the loan amount here. So that's what this first piece of math is. It's $178,500 value of the property times the 90% loan to value ratio. So that means we're borrowing $160,650. And that's an important number because the interest is not going to be based on the sales price. The interest is going to be based on the what? On the loan amount. So now we can calculate our interest because we have our loan amount. Loan amount, $160,650 times 4.5% annual interest. That's $7,229.25, and they want monthly, so what are we going to do with it? Divide it by 12, that is $602.44 a month. How do you feel about that? Yes, ma'am. What are the samples for this? It's the same exact thing we were doing before. It's just, can you calculate a loan-to-value ratio? Okay. As long as you can calculate the loan amount, it's exactly the same as it was before. It's just show, it's adding in that wrinkle of not giving you the loan amount, but rather giving you the loan-to-value ratio. Okay. Remember, anytime you're doing loan math, obviously the loan amount is going to be very important. Okay? All right, let's do this. Let's um, take a quick break. Um, take a quick restroom break, come back to say 9.15, quick one, and then I'm going to show you a couple other things and get you out of here a little bit early, I hope. Um, not real early, but a little bit early. So take like a, a few minute bathroom break, and we'll come back and talk about breaking down that mortgage payment. Okay, so you're going to come back and do the long value more? No, not long to value. We're going to break down the mortgage payment. Oh, you're going to learn this thing. Okay. <laughs>